Welcome to all of you to this third panel at this conference that is um, asking the question of autonomy and tile autonomy, partly autonomy, um, from very different perspectives and in a very concrete way and in a very theoretical way, so in theory and practice. I proposed because the organization was, I mean, we can also think about it, was it autonomous or not of this whole conference, but in a, an autonomous way, I got uh, an email um, that it would be nice if we would do something here. I was very honored that this would be nice and felt immediately um, called to be autonomous to propose something. And the proposal was to think about para-institutions um, the subtitle is Beside and Beyond the Museum, the University. Let me just quickly try to relate this idea of the para-institution to some things that have been talked here so far. If we imagine the history of the institution as a governing body, but also as a social context in which we organize in order to do something together, uh, we experience in the last 30 years that we are more and more governed by infrastructures and algorithms and mathematics and institutional logics that come up with this and that number minus this and that number that at the end have a lot of consequences for us where very often we don't see um, the conditions of production of these mathematics. Behind this background we experienced that what we believed were institutions are very often emptified in their institutional quality and governing us exactly through this, I mean, we could call them neoliberal strategies of governance. Um, now, institutions, and we know it, are, are not in themselves a fantastic thing. The long history of art is also, the long history, or let's say the history of art of the 20th century and especially after the 60s with uh, concept art and institutional critique is full of artistic strategies to question the powerful mechanisms of institutions. Mm -hmm. The powerful mechanism of institutions being, um, of course, places of exclusion and inclusion, being places of hierarchies, being places of exploitation and being mostly if we think as, at institutions like the university or the museum, deeply embedded in a structure of knowledge production that is, of course, part of the Enlightenment movement that is in itself embedded in the history of colonization. So there is nothing to say about the fantasticness of the bourgeois institution, mm -hmm. the museum, the university, but at the same time, we have to also get clear about the fact that these institutions are more and more emptified by new strategies that are governing us. And in this, in this situation, many artists and activists and theorists and thinkers have tried to, to, to find a way to act within a situation that seems to have no outside. So how can we act in an institution when actually the governing logic seems to have no outside. We cannot say, hey, let's close the institutions. And then, um, and some people, one example could be the book, The Undercommons by Stefano Mahani and Fred Moten, start to think about how to act despite the institutions. How to act within or without, but despite the institutions. And um, I wanted to think about that. I think this is an artistic strategy that has also been used by, by artists um, at the last Documenta exhibitions, uh, by many artists already since Documenta 5 with these museums. We can see that the idea of claiming to become an institution, claiming to become a museum, and there was a whole space dedicated to these artist museums, we could see this in itself as a way to, to deal with these questions. And I would call the more and more, um, the fact that more and more in artists are interested to be museums, um, and let's say a, 
a way to deal with these problematics. Um, they, they claim to be museums, and I would call this claim para-museums. These uh, strategies to, let's say, para-things, like to act not, not, neither only within nor only against an institution, but to act beside and beyond an institution. So to, to act insisting and, and persisting in another possible way of thinking than the mathematics are asking us, and to do it even though we do modularized studies, even though we are on Facebook, even though we are every day played out against each other in every learning and working situation. So this idea of a beside and beyond, this is something that I would relate to this prefix para. And um, in this same sense, I also would just a little beside talk about the um, monument by Olu Oguibe as a para monument. It's, I would not say it is, it is neither a monument that takes the form of the obelisk as something completely affirmative, nor is it a counter monument that creates a negative form in relation to this, but no, it is an artistic strategy beside and beyond the monument using two powerful forms, the Bible and the history of the obelisk, in order to deturn it and give it another possible meaning. And this is, is an interesting strategy. It, is, it has the form of an obelisk and it uses the form of the obelisk in order to say something else, to say something different. A kind of appropriation of the form. An appropriation of the form and an appropriation of the Bible. And this strategy, I would call it a para strategy. <coughs> we can talk, discuss about this um, more, but I just wanted to introduce why. Why do I want to talk about para institutions on a symposium about autonomy? I think, yes, it's important to claim independence, it's important to claim solidarity and interdependence, but in somehow we also have to come to terms with the fact that we are governed and organized by structures that expect, I think, from us also other strategies. And the, what I would propose are para-strategies of acting despite of the way we are governing. We are governed. Um, Okay, so this is what I wanted to think about, and I think amazing people are doing this in the moment in the world, and some of them, I'm very honored, agreed to come. Um, and so I, I just wrote to um, colleagues and um, comrades in crime, um, to Christopher Wessels, Elena Agudio, and, Elsa, uh, and then Elena invited Elsa. Um, actually, concretely, I wrote to two institutions, which, which are both collectively managed within and beyond the world of art, within and beyond the world of art institutions and art discourses. Uh, one of them is the Museum of Impossible Forms in Helsinki, which is, um, uh, which is a space in the, in the first floor of a shopping mall from the 80s, a bit in the outskirts of Helsinki. Ah, built in the 70s, a bit in the outskirts of Helsinki. Late 60s, early 70s. Um, is deeply embedded in a history of migration, deeply embedded in a history of the welfare state, now being a place where many um, new businesses started for people ca that came in the last years. To Helsinki. So it is a place of migrant businesses. And in this very sense, also, I would understand the Museum of Impossible Forms as a place where um, we can also think and understand economies of art spaces, because it's an economical space, it's, an, it's a shopping mall, mm -hmm. and it is a way of claiming the shopping mall para institutionally to become a space to think together. Now, if I tell you first floor, on one side of it is a um, hairdresser, and then you go a bit, and then you see something, I mean, to call it a mosque is wrong because the, the mosque needs to follow specific rules, but it's a prayer room. And then you have this, I, I love the space, the Museum of Impossible Forms, a bit like a seminar room. Um, yeah, Chris will, of course, talk about it much more, but 
the Museum of Impossible Forms was founded, um, I think, 2016. Yeah, it was kind of conceptualized and it got realized in 2017. And it was last year. <laughs> yeah. And since then, cl claims to be a museum, and since then uh, intervenes strongly in debates in Helsinki, and I think is pretty successful in this. Um, also building alternative structures um, more in the shadow of these debates. Okay, this is, I mean, you see, I am uh, very uh, astonished and happy that this institution exists. And there is another institution that I very much admire, um, and this is Savi Contemporary, a place in Berlin that was founded by Bonaventure and Die Kuhn. And um, I mean, I cannot talk about Savi without talking about him, but this is only because he is so important to me. Um, and when we, when, when I met him actually one day in Berlin when I presented a book and he came and he said, you have to come and see it. And then I, I was of course super impressed. And then we came with some students. And in this moment when we were there with the students, he made very clear that he would do what he's doing if there would be money or if there would be no money if he would be embraced and loved and used by everyone, or if he would be threatened and questioned by everyone. And this is, I think, a very strong para-institutional perspective. Now we have to imagine um, Savi Contemporary as a place of collaborative knowledge production. Uh, there is a library, a library that assembles a very important knowledge uh, also about art, and art production in the young African cities. Also after, this is something I'm very interested in, also after the, the liberation, yeah. after yeah. decolonization. Yeah. And you can find there the discourses of these magazines and new p newspapers and many more extremely important things are, are in this archive and library. Beside that, it is a space for art production and many other projects, we will hear about them today I'm very glad that Elena Agudio, who works there as much as a curator, as also a driving force, <laughs> agreed to come. Life force, yes. <laughs> Women's life force. And yeah, and she brought Esa Westreicher, who will present us today um, a project that gives insights and what you actually you plan for the future. So far, I, I, I think we will discuss a lot. I stop for now here, also because um, I have the honor to announce uh, a lecture performance by Christopher Wessels, uh, who will introduce us from the perspective of an artist and a curator um, in a para-institutional practice of thinking and speaking the para-institution. So, uh, welcome Christopher Wessels. Three musings. The agency of the witness. A liturgy for the converted. Please hold hands and stand. Or please hold each other's hands and rise up. Could you repeat after me every sentence or line that starts with hack? Hack into dietary sustenance. Hack into dietary sustenance. Tradition versus health. Hack into comfort compliance. Hack into comfort compliance. Hack into the rebellious gene. Hack into doctrine. Hack into doctrine. Capitalism, the relation of free labor and slavery. Hack into the history of the bank. Hack into the history of the bank. Is beating the odds the mere act of joining the winning team? Hack into desperation and loneliness. Hack into desperation and loneliness. The history of community and the marketplace. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into business, law of proprietorship. Hack into business, law of proprietorship. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into ambition and greed. 
Hack into forms of government. Hack into forms of government. The history of revolutions. The relation of suffering and sufferance. Hack into faith and morality. Hack into faith and morality. The treatment of one faith towards another. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality. What is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared. Hack into God. Hack into God. The stories of creation, serpents and eggs. Hack into coincidence. Hack into coincidence. The summer of 68. The 27th club. The number of people with Facebook profiles. People who share. People who share too much. People who seem lonely. People who want to connect. People who want to uplift. People who need uplifting. Three simple copper wires coiled around an orb. Parked in an orbit. Equatorial landmines. Useful and precious metals, Colton as cotton, Colton as cotton, Colton as cotton. Hack into whores, Hack into whores. industrial digital, hack into, code. hack into code. Use your instrument as metaphor, hallowed to the ground, typing the mainframe, dismantle definition, dogma and duty. Hack into the database. Hold it in the subconscious. The panel marks survival. Hack into celebrity. Hack into the cultural development of taste. Hack into violence, fear, and ignorance. How are they linked? You may sit. It is a poem by Saul Williams called Colton as Cotton. My first musing will be a musing on miracles. And it's a collective musing that was done. A musing, it's a contemplation. It's a contemplation of miracles, on miracles. And it's done collectively with a colleague of mine, Bonaventure Sobiang and Kung, and Giovanna Esposito Yusuf. Miracles. And miracle making are manifestations of the impossible. Not because the impossible is impossible, but because the impossible is thought impossible. That is, for those that exist in or accept the normalcy of what is framed as possible. As for Bra Lee Scratch Perry, who once said, I'm a miracle man. Things happen which I don't plan. I've never planned anything whatsoever. I do. I want it to be an instant action object, instant action reaction subject, instant input, instant output. The concept of the impossible seems to be rather the rule than the exception. Miracles are thus the performativity of all those concepts that have the prefix with im, in, an, or otherwise imply the contrary, the opposite, the negative of as in impossible, invisible, inaccessible, unbelievable, unacceptable, unrecoverable. But once the miracle is performed, that is to say, once the prefix is obliterated in impossible, takes form, in these lines, one can understand the greater miracle of perception as braving what has been normalized as challenging the frames of perception and the rationale of the knowing. It implies a teleological suspension of miracle making and entails reparation of the bonds between our cognitive understandings and the plurality of knowledges and literacies through which they manifest. As such, it expands what can be perceived, experienced, done, and imagined. Miriculum is the Latin word for an object of wonder. Mirari, to wonder at, marvel, be astonished, and figuratively it means to regard, esteem. The astonishment and marvel that a young man could heal by making a blind to see, or taking control of the norms of nature by walking on water or performing a social act like sharing a loaf of bread, and fish to thousands of people, 
For indeed, miracle making is the act of losing one's innocence, of seeing that what is, was not meant to be seen, or being cognizant of what is not meant to be understood. So maybe the miracle is not really the act of making the blind man see, but making the onlookers to see and believe that the act of healing the blind is possible. It is crucial to underline that in order to grasp the engineering and machinery behind the performing and performance of miracles and how these impact societies, their cultures and politics, one must address how the miraculous has been plundered, sedimenting the knowledges of miracle making and turning them into dominant discourses or ideologies to maintain and justify the privilege of a few. It's been a common practice in the instrumentalizing the extraordinary. It serves to the construction and preservation of the exception and the ruled. Capitalist and colonial systems and practices have feasted on the miracles of transmutation through the transformation of bodies and land into resources that feed the exception with the aim to make believe that their realization is both miraculous and an act of what is possible. While the realization of what they label as others belongs to the realm of the impossible. The word miracle has also been attached to processes of economic recovery and growth or forms of social political organization that subtract from their narratives the implications of those processes to manifest. Such is the case where I live in the Nordic model of the welfare state result of strong social organization and collective bargaining, and more recently the Finnish education system, both have widely been mythologized, creating such big shadows that makes it difficult to understand how they came to be and how they are currently being shattered by strong new liberal and corporocratic policies, education and the welfare state as miracles, knowledge as miracles. Having the privilege to belong is like transforming water into wine. The miracle of privilege. Now, the question at stake is how can the epistemics and performity... Now, let me go on a tangent. And here, I'm going to read Kobena Mercer on Adrian Piper on page 119 of the Adrian Piper Reader. <clears throat> Performativity demands we think not in linear geometries, but rather with those of a Mobius strip. Mobius is some cartoon from Belgium. Piper unsettled the dichotomies of subject-object, active-passive, and visible-invisible in acts of discrepant embodiment that even now have the power to confound our available terms of analysis and comprehension. And here, Kobeno Mercer is talking specifically about um, the body of work known as catalysis. And catalysis, and it's, I specifically here want you to envision catalysis three, which is a moment where Adrian Piper in the, in the 70s, 1970 to be specific, painted her clothes in white emulsion paint with wet paint written on it and went to Macy's to buy a pair of sunglasses and some other sundries. Now, Kobena Mercer here looks at what happens. To say the beholder is empowered by not seeing is to countenance the view that contrary to the commonplace notion that seeing guarantees knowing is not knowing that is foundational to the optical politics of social privilege. The not knowing that follows from not seeing would thus be the prior condition without which neither white or male privilege would exist. Liberal humanist critiques of misrecognition have drawn attention to the injurious consequences of going unseen. I'm still quoting Kobena Mercer. But Piper was the first to show that invisibly, invisibility is interactively produced 
when reciprocity is withheld through the act of not looking. Piper's art, by turning into the alternative epistemologies opened by performance and operating in the realm of pre-verbal affect, generated a kind of surplus knowledge that eludes the codific codification in language. And for me, this moment of, of Piper's work, what he references, is becoming aware of your role as a witness and the agency of a witness in times of change. Back to the talk. Now the question at stake is how can the epistemics and performativity of miracles be explored through the physicality of an exhibition and embodied experientiality of the peoples, artists, thinkers, musicians, visitors. If miracles are embodied spiritual, natural, philosophical, and abstract phenomena, phenomena they are expressed in the forms of, and here I quote Irobi, Proverbs, oral poetry, rap, incantation, storytelling, dance, theater, festival, ritual, and the plastic arts. These cost concepts become manifest in the transcendental phenomenology in action to both initiates and outsiders. Our aim is to explore a wide understanding of what miracles can be, ranging from the ability of making wonders to the etymological Sanskrit root, smera, or Greek root, meidan, which means smile. For the next musing, musing on jazz, there's a meditative soundtrack, and if you wish you could note it and listen to it in your own time as homework or as as an energy source. And the playlist is Miles Davis, So What Kind of Blue, published in 1959. Nina Simone, Don't Smoke in Bed, the live in concert, live in New York, published in 1964. Archie Sheps, The Magic of Juju, from the album The Magic of Juju, published in 1967. And Cecil Taylor, Sal Walk for Celeste, Take One, Sal Walk for Celeste, 1961. And Sun Ra and the orchestra, There's a Change in the Air, on the album Antique Blacks, published in 1978. If I could find the spot where truth echoes, I would stand there and whisper memories of my children's future. I would let their future dwell in my past so that I might live a brighter now. Now is the essence of my domain and it contains all that was and will be, and I am as I was and will be, because I am and always will be. It's the opening stanza to a, another one of Saul Williams' poems called Shaklak Clack. And let me kick off with another quote, this time by Jacques Attali. Someone I don't really agree on, agree with, but he had some interesting thoughts on noise. Our science has always desired to monitor, measure, abstract and castrate meaning, forgetting that life is full of noise and that death alone is silent. Work noise, noise of man, and noise of beast. Noise bought, noise sold, or prohibited. Nothing essential happens in the absence of noise. Now, this is amusing on jazz and other noise, a, a musical form that has deeply influenced me is jazz. Then within jazz, it is modal jazz tradition that for me becomes the music that starts talking about other possibilities. The beauty of it lies in its very obvious homage to the blues. Thus, its acknowledgement of its struggle roots. The Oxford English Dictionary defines modal as form as opposed to substance. Modal jazz can thus be defined as jazz that uses forms of music or modes of music instead of chord progressions as a harmonic framework. Miles Davis' Kind of Blue, published in 69, and the song So What is regarded as the epitome 
of this modal jazz tradition. The break from Western classical music is probably the reason why it was regarded as noise, as unsophisticated. And another one of Atali's quotes is that if one takes the conception that music noise is prophetic, then it is certainly modal jazz that ushers us into a new possibility, a new future. And Atali says, it heralds for it is prophetic. It has always been in its essence a herald of times to come, talking about music. Thus, as we see, if it is true that the political organization of the 20th century is rooted in the political thought of the 19th, the latter is almost entirely, entirely present in embryonic form in the music of the 18th century. Sissel, I'm searching. What does your atonality suggest? With its butchering and deconstruction of old melodies, reinventing them to give new meaning, other meaning. Soloists improvising to redefine sound, the rest of the ensemble waiting in the wings, keeping the ship steady, sure of its form, not sure of where it will end. It is modal jazz, if modal jazz represents a new beginning in the conception and expression of Western music, then it is Sun Ra and his orchestra with a cacophony of dissonance, warning us of our cognitive dissonance in time and space. Then it is Archie Shep, who through free jazz, brings jazz back to its maternal home of resistance, breaking the shackles of capitalist patriarchy that has so successfully commodified and captured the spirit of change that this music was, is, and will demands or is demanding. If it is the polytonality of modal jazz that for me becomes a tool that I want to use to explore the practice of noise. The tonality of music, essentially the arrangement of chords to create a perceived hierarchy of perceived relations, stabilities and attractions. Polytonality then is essentially a cacophony or many hierarchies of stabilities and attractions. Noise needs to seek to subvert these hierarchies while at the same time to amplify the poly nature of things. It needs to constantly be in a position where it is in a rehearsal of rebellion. It must crack the dome that colonizes our mind. Countering the normative needs to be its starting point as it blasts through our stratosphere, taking us into space where the impossible is considered because we know what's possible. Borders must be challenged. Ambiguities and paradoxes must be encouraged. It needs to help us experience those temporary moments of emancipation for the journey to freedom is long because we do not yet know what freedom is. It comes and it goes. It must help us rethink risk and help us reimagine risk in its non-economic determinist manifestations because on our march to freedom, it is risks we must take. It needs to help us decolonize our bodies and decolonize our minds. We need to breathe in and out. It needs to take us out of our elitist bubbles and help us unlearn our privilege as a loss. We need to rethink the margins as the center and move towards the conception of the center for the study of the impossible and the musing of impossible forms. If I could find the spot where truth echoes, I would stand there and whisper memories of my children's future. I would let their future dwell in my past so that I might live a brighter now. Now is the essence of my domain and it contains all that was and will be. And I am as I was and will be because I am and always will be. That is the opening stanza of a poem by Saul Williams called Shaklak Clack. Third musing is amusing on cinema. According to Lewis Gordon, reasonability can embrace contradictions. In fact, he argues that it must do so in order to evaluate itself, and this leads to his conclusion that the scope of reason, quote, exceeds rationality, end quote. 
We know that in the production of cinema, the disciplines that collaborate are in a constant conversation and constant consideration. But we also know that this considered relationality is governed by a deeply entrenched hierarchy. So at its core, the act of disciplinary disobedience is the fracturing and disillusion of hierarchy and exploring the potentiality of a constant conversation and consideration without it. Thus, to sincerely realize a reason that exceeds rationality, it is imperative to venture into the realm of the conception and the realization of miracles within the ensemble of the collective. Rethinking, being, becomes foundational in the realization of the impossible. So understanding that the production of cinema in its essence is a collaborative exercise, by using the cinematic as method for exploring miracles or the impossible, the object is not the realization of a film, but the exploration of a broader ecosystem or community that blossoms around the process. This is partly a contestation to the hierarchical structures manifesting as ontological within the production of cinema. It is about developing ways of contesting the everyday, using the space of cinema to explore those impossibilities. How does this process of recreating miracles in cinema, for example, Pio Pasolini's levitating woman in the film Theorema, help in nurturing ways of contestation? How does one rehearse dismantling impossibility through the practice of cinema? And how does this help in the dismantling of other impossibilities of the everyday? Please hold hands and rise up. Again, repeat every word, every sentence that starts with hack. Hack into dietary sustenance. Hack into dietary sustenance. Tradition versus health. Hack into comfort compliance. Hack into, comfort compliance. Hack into the rebellious gene. Hack into, the rebellious gene. Hack into doctrine. Hack into doctrine. Capitalism, the relation of free labor and slavery. Hack into the history of the bank. Hack into the history of the bank. Is beating the odds the mere act of joining the winning team. Hack into desperation and loneliness. The history of community and the marketplace. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into, land rights and ownership. Hack into, business. Hack into business. Law of proprietorship. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into, ambition and greed. Hack into forms of government. Hack into forms of government. The history of revolutions. The relation of suffering and sufferance. Hack into faith and morality. The treatment of one faith toward another. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality. What is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared. Hack into God. Stories of creation, serpents and eggs. Hack into coincidence. The summer of 68. The 27th club. The number of people with Facebook profiles. People who choose to share, people who share too much, people who seem lonely, people who want to connect, people who want to uplift, people who need uplifting. Three simple copper wires coiled around an orb, parked in an orbit, equatorial landmines, useful and precious metals, Colton as cotton, Colton as cotton, Colton as cotton. Hacking to whores. Industrial digital, hack into code. Hack into code. Use your instrument as metaphor. Hello to the ground. Type into the mainframe. Dismantle definition, dogma, and duty. Hack into the database. Hack into the database. Hold it in the subconscious. The panel marked survival. Hack into celebrity. Hack into, celebrity. Hack into the cultural development of taste. Hack into, the cultural development of taste. Hack into violence. Fear and ignorance. How are they linked? Before you sit down, as a footnote, 
So Saul Williams in the opening stanza to the poem, Shaklak Clack, places the reader smack bang into some schizo temporality. He yearns for the spot where truth echoes, a space of sorts, and imagines space in the real. He questions the possibility of truth, inferring an impossibility in his quest for it, but that does not stop him. He, through his poetry, defies our knowledge of time and space to talk about a now and an imagined future unknown. I would stand there and whisper memories of my children's future, endeavoring for us, the audience, listener, reader, to develop a sensitivity to his subjectivity. You may sit. Oh, I've even prepared a hymn. So um, we'll sing a song. It's going to be karaoke. Can everybody see the screen? Okay. I need to make the screen bigger. This is that uncomfortable moment where you can talk to each other. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'll, I'll lead, but you guys are, are welcome to sing along, obviously. Um, it's a karaoke, and um, I've been practicing this with my children, just to kind of now get it right. My daughter thinks I should, I should go, go to idols, <laughs> um, but she, she just likes me. I think she, there's a partiality. It's a song by John Lennon called Working Class Hero. As soon as you're born, they make you feel small By giving you no time instead of it all Till the pain is so big, you feel nothing at all Working class hero is something to be A working class hero is something to be They hurt you at home and they hit you at school They hate you if you're clever and despise them Till you're so fucking crazy you can't follow their rules A working class hero is something to be A working class hero is something to be When they've tortured and scared you for 20 odd years Then they expect you to pick a career When you can't really function You're so full of fear Here's hope A working class hero is something to be And yeah, I wanted to go just can, but I can't really do it A working class hero is something to be Keep you doped with religion and sex and TV And you think you're so clever and classless and free But you're still fucking peasants as far as I can see A working class hero is something to be 
working class hero is something to be. There's a room at the top they are telling you still. But first you must learn how to smile as you kill. If you want to be like the folks on the hill. A working class hero is something to be. A working class hero is something to be. Now this is where I disagree with John Lennon a bit. And I suppose um, Tina Turner becomes more relevant. Thank you. So after this um, para prayer that we heard, um, we decided to just go on with the presentations and have then a discussion of all together. And um, I am I'm really happy that uh, Elena and Elsa agreed to introduce us a bit also in some concrete projects that you have done and that you will do so that we have something concrete on the table. Just to tell you how I see this could go. So on the one hand, it is of course about presentations and we also, people have really thought about how to think about autonomy. Um, on the other hand, it would be really nice in the following discussion to link it to the very concrete situation in which we are here now. But first of all, um, I am very happy to give the word to Elena Agudio from Savi Contemporary in Berlin. Thanks a lot. So first of all, yes, I want to uh, thank uh, Nora a lot for inviting us in such a relevant discussion. But I also want to thank uh, Chris, because I, th I mean, he, you left me speechless. Uh, so I hope I will manage to talk because I'm, I'm somehow moved uh, by your intervention. So when invited to reflect on, uh, um, on, on Savi as an institution, an institution that is since its beginning uh, questioning itself and understanding itself as something in, a, um, in um, a structure in constant becoming, of course we've also been addressing um, the concept of autonomy. Um, as uh, um, Chantal Mouffe uh, has been uh, um, uh, claiming and explaining in uh, the seminar article called uh, Institutions at Site of Agonistic Interventions, um, there are <coughs> two possibilities to address uh, the reality and to challenge this, the neoliberal um, system in which we are finding ourselves, uh, ourselves embedded in. Uh, there is a strategy of Withdrawal, so withdrawing, uh, withdrawing uh, with the, from the institutions and finding uh, using critical artistic practice uh, to engage, uh, um, um, uh, disentangling uh, it yourself from the institution uh, and trying to ch to create another um, reality. Or there is a strategy of engagement with the institution, trying to enter and even parasite, um, as a parasite, uh, uh, attacking the institution and changing it from within. So I think um, here the conversation with you, um, Nora, could exactly also be tackled in this way because both uh, possibilities, I think, are very relevant and you are doing that and many other people are doing that choosing to work from within the institution uh, and trying to... Um, yeah, I mean, beside and beyond, yes. neither within nor outside. Exactly. But in our case, uh, when Savi Contemporary was founded in uh, 2008 by Bonaventure, um, uh, the idea was really to be 
uh, not even beside, but at the beginning was really being beyond because there was no uh, support, uh, no financial, no structural, noth nobody could um, um, support the choice of Bonaventure to create, to create this extra space, this extra territory where he could develop his, uh, um, his agency and his uh, positions and his resistance. So um, maybe aspect that, uh, we decided that Elsa was tackling a little bit uh, also the concept of autonomy and then we want of course to also explain how we're working concretely in practice, how we are a performative space uh, um, reflecting on uh, autonomy, on uh, how uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, the fact that we are collaborating and receiving fundings from um, public uh, institutions is affecting our practice and how we are dealing with uh, with these issues. So let's uh, have uh, Elsa starting and then we will ping pong a little bit and then we will introduce uh, um, a project that will start soon uh, in 2000, end of 2018 and 2019. Uh, and this is actually the first uh, uh, school project that we are uh, activating at Savi, a school project that of course is also trying to undo uh, and, uh, um, and challenge the idea of what a school is. Uh, and of course, a school that is completely independent from any academic realm, but that is stemming from with within um, Savvy Contemporary and from within our experience and our, our practice. So yes, let's start with you and then we continue ping pong. Yeah? Great, perfect. So again, also thank you very, very much for inviting us, Nora. It's a really a great pleasure and also honor. Um, and yes, so, uh, you know, with this amazing, beautiful title, um, you know, that is also very complex, we kind of started to ask ourselves, whoops, is this showing? No. no. Um, yes, yes, it's showing. You okay. kind of see it because Good. you are uh, on this side. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, so we kind of uh, were invited on the basis of, um, of, you know, a couple of sentences which, you know, already led to uh, really quite a few questions um, because, again, the sentence was also very complex. So um, um, you can read it in the program, but I'll quickly read it out to you as well. Um, with the Museum of Impossible Forms Helsinki and Savi Contemporary Berlin, we will encounter two para institutions, uh, laboratories aiming to share ideas that might not exist yet, places where we could learn together what we don't know yet. What does all this mean in relation to the university and to the Kunsthochschule, etc.? I won't get into detail with this. But so even when we have the first sentence, um, you know, <laughs> In a way, like, the question revolves around even the term para institution and somehow the hidden expectations that are in this sentence. Um, because, you know, somehow you, the audience, uh, are promised to encounter two para institutions. Uh, and to be, I, I think Chris did a really good job at sort of performing it himself here. Um, and we feel probably more as representatives of Savi Contemporary and somehow will try to you know, get an idea across of who we are. Um, but I can't promise that this works out, we'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and if, you know, and if Savi Contemporary is a power institution, then beside what exactly is it? And beyond what exactly is it? Uh, beside and beyond the status quo of traditional established institutions, uh, beside and beyond generally accepted knowledge systems or generally accepted practices of knowledge, thought sharing, uh, beside and beyond the socio-political status quo, beside beyond usual ways of commoning, or beside uh, usual neg negotiated frameworks, or maybe even all of that. Um, then the next question comes uh, from uh, another part of the sentence, uh, which is, what can one think as ideas that might not exist yet? You know, in the sense that don't all ideas that we share already exist in one form or another, might this question not actually ask for ideas that exist and have existed for millennia, but were violently silenced, willfully ignored, or even slaughtered? And if you already mentioned these circumstances, are they still treated this way? Is this the beside and beyond that we talk about when we talk about para? And is that realm that, be, uh, that can be called para because it tries to encounter this violence by digging deep into these existing, non-existent ideas and thereby prove Western supremacist thinking and doing wrong? Um, and here we already get to that we, 
you know, that very complicated we. Uh, which we, I mean, what, which we are we even talking about? What assumptions does this we put, uh, do we put into that we? Uh, who is included in that we and who is excluded? When I think about this, um, I sometimes dearly hope that Freud was wrong when he said as, um, that a we only emerges in contrast or opposition to a them, um, to the construction of an other. But what if we already are, um, if we are already othering when we define the stereotyped Western supremacist as this other? And what if that other is actually included in that we? Uh, what if that Western supremacist is maybe not only our family, but even maybe ourselves? Uh, many occasions here to get paranoid. Or actually, might that idea of para as beside and beyond even yield some kind of hope for a kind of transitionary phase, where the other is not the opposition, but as Nora points out, the beside. That which we live in despite our wishes and desires and that which we hope to change. Hope to change by way of unlearning the untruth of Western supremacy and stepping up against its lies. So here, when we talk about learning together what we don't know yet, which is also taken from the sentence, it may rather be about unlearning what one, not we, thinks one knows, and maybe simply wonder. And this is kind of like a parallel to what you were saying too with the miracle. Uh, so, to say in a, so to say that we find ourselves in some kind of limb of knowledge, but that there maybe we can actually um, find something else that can emerge. Um, so that something else may well be a presence in form of an institution, uh, you know, something existing in situ, uh, so to say, um, a presence performing its own existence, uh, and that struggles to uphold its autonomy, that struggles in a sense to uphold its capacity to play with its own rules on an individual basis, but also in relation to other institutions, that perform this openly, publicly, but also in thousands of emails, meetings, and phone calls. So I think this is a good moment to start uh, a slideshow that we prepared, uh, which will sort of function as a kind of invocation of Savi Contemporary. Um, and I'll pass, and in the meantime, pass the word to Elena to maybe elaborate a bit on what kind of space we are. Yes. So um, Savi Contemporary is defining itself as a space for conviviality. Um, meaning uh, that Savi Contemporary is considering itself an open space where, I mean, our dog. Welcome to all of you to this third panel at this conference that is um, asking the question of autonomy and tile autonomy, partly autonomy, um, from very different perspectives and in a very concrete way and in a very theoretical way. So in theory and practice, I proposed because the organization was, I mean, we can also think about it. Was it autonomous or not of this whole conference? But in a, an autonomous way, I got uh, an email um, that it would be nice if we would do something here. I was very honored that this would be nice and felt immediately um, called to be autonomous to propose something. And the proposal was to think about para-institutions. Um, the subtitle is Beside and Beyond the Museum, the University. Let me just quickly try to relate this idea of the para-institution to some things that have been talked here so far. If we imagine the history of the institution as a governing body, but also as a social context in which we organize in order to do something together, uh, we experience in the last 30 years that we are more and more governed by infrastructures and algorithms and mathematics and institutional logics that come up with this and that number minus this and that number that at the end have a lot of consequences for us where very often we don't see um, the conditions of production of these mathematics. Behind this background, we experienced that what we believed were institutions are very often emptified in their institutional quality and governing us exactly through this, I mean, we could call them neoliberal strategies of governance. 
Um, now, institutions, and we know it, uh, are not in themselves a fantastic thing. The long history of art is also, the long history, or let's say the history of art of the 20th century, and especially after the 60s with uh, concept art and institutional critique, is full of artistic strategies to question the powerful mechanisms of institutions. The powerful mechanism of institutions being, um, of course, places of exclusion and inclusion, being places of hierarchies, being places of exploitation, and being mostly, if we think as, at institutions like the university or the museum, deeply embedded in a structure of knowledge production that is, of course, part of the Enlightenment movement that is in itself embedded in the history of colonization. So, there is nothing to say about the fantasticness of the bourgeois institution, mm -hmm. the museum, the university, but at the same time, we have to also get clear about the fact that these institutions are more and more emptified by new strategies that are governing us. And in this, in this situation, many artists and activists and theorists and thinkers have tried to, to, to find a way to act within a situation that seems to have no outside. So how can we act in an institution when actually the governing logic seems to have no outside? We cannot say, hey, let's close the institutions. And then, um, and some people, one example could be the book The Undercommons by Stefano Mahani and Fred Moten, start to think about how to act despite the institutions. How to act within or without, but despite the institutions. And um, I wanted to think about that. I think this is an artistic strategy that has also been used by, by artists um, at the last Documenta exhibitions, uh, by many artists already since Documenta 5 with these museums, we can see that the idea of claiming to become an institution, claiming to become a museum, and there was a whole space dedicated to these artist museums, we could see this in itself as a way to, to deal with these questions. And I would call the more and more, um, the fact that more and more in artists are interested to be museums, um, and let's say, a, a way to deal with these problematics. Um, they, they claim to be museums, and I would call this claim para-museums. These uh, strategies to, let's say, para-things, like to act not, not, neither only within nor only against an institution, but to act beside and beyond an institution. So to, to act, insisting and, and persisting in another possible way of thinking than the mathematics are asking us, and to do it even though we do modularized studies, even though we are on Facebook, even though we are every day played out against each other in every learning and working situation. So this idea of a beside and beyond this is something that I would relate to this prefix para. And um, in this same sense, I also would just a little beside talk about the um, monument by Olu Oguibe as a para monument. It's, I would not say it is, it is neither a monument that takes the form of the obelisk as something completely affirmative, nor is it a counter monument that creates a negative form in relation to this, but no, it is an artistic strategy beside and beyond the monument using two powerful forms, the Bible and the history of the obelisk, in order to deturn it and give it another possible meaning. And this is, is an interesting strategy. It, is, it has the form of an obelisk and it uses the form of the obelisk in order to say something else, to say something different. A kind of appropriation of the form. An appropriation of the form and an appropriation of the Bible. And this strategy, I would call it a para-strategy. <coughs> we can discuss about this um, 
more, but I just wanted to introduce why. Why do I want to talk about para institutions on a symposium about autonomy? I think, yes, it's important to claim independence, it's important to claim solidarity and interdependence, but in somehow we also have to come to terms with the fact that we are governed and organized by structures that expect, I think, from us also other strategies. And the, what I would propose are para strategies of acting despite of the way we are governing. We are governed. Um, okay, so this is what I wanted to think about. And I think amazing people are doing this in the moment in the world. And some of them, I'm very honored, agreed to come. Um, and so I, I just wrote to um, colleagues and um, comrades in crime. Um, to Christopher Wessels, Elena Agudio, and, Elsa, uh, and then Elena invited Elsa. Um, actually, concretely, I wrote to uh, two institutions, which, which are both collectively managed, within and beyond the world of art, within and beyond the world of art institutions and art discourses. Uh, one of them is the Museum of Impossible Forms in Helsinki, which is um, uh, which is a space in the, in the first floor of a shopping mall from the 80s, a bit in the outskirts of Helsinki. Ah, built in the 70s, a bit in the outskirts of Helsinki. Late 60s, early 70s. Um, is deeply embedded in a history of migration, deeply embedded in a history of the welfare state, now being a place where many um, new businesses started for people ca that came in the last years to Helsinki. So it is a place of migrant businesses. And in this very sense also, I would understand the Museum of Impossible Forms as a place where um, we can also think and understand economies of art spaces, because it's an economical space, it's, an sh it's a shopping mall, mm -hmm. and it is a way of claiming the shopping mall para-institutionally to become a space to think together. Now, if I tell you first floor, on one side of it is a um, hairdresser, mm -hmm. and then you go a bit, and then you see something, I mean, to call it the mosque is wrong, because the, the mosque needs to follow specific rules, but it's a prayer room. And then you have this, I, I love the space, the Museum of Impossible Forms, a bit like a seminar room. Um, yeah, Chris will of course talk about it much more, but the Museum of Impossible Forms was founded, um, I think, 2016. Yeah, it's kind of conceptualized and it got realized in 2017. And it was last year. <laughs> yeah, and since then, it claims to be a museum and since then uh, intervenes strongly in debates in Helsinki and I think is pretty successful in this. Um, also building alternative structures um, more in the shadow of these debates. Okay, this is, I mean, you see I am uh, very uh, astonished and happy that this institution exists. And there is another institution that I very much admire um, and this is Savi Contemporary, a place in Berlin that was founded by Bonaventure and, um, I mean, I cannot talk about Savi without talking about him, but this is only because he is so important to me. Um, and when we, when, when I met him actually one day in Berlin when I presented a book and he came and he said, you have to come and see it. And then I, I was, of course, super impressed. And then we came with some students. And in this moment, when we were there with the students, he made very clear that he would do what he is doing if there would be money or if there would be no money if he would be embraced and loved and used by everyone, or if he would be threatened and questioned by everyone. And this is, I think, a very strong para-institutional perspective. Now, we have to imagine um, Savi Contemporary as a place of collaborative knowledge production. Uh, there is a library, a library that assembles a very important knowledge uh, also about art, and art production in the young African cities. Also after, this is something I'm very interested in, also after the, the liberation, yeah. after decolonization. And you can find there the discourses of these magazines and new p newspapers and many more extremely important things are, are in this archive and library. Beside that, it is a space for art production and many other projects. We will hear about them today 
I'm very glad that Elena Agudio, who works there as much as a curator, as also a driving force, <laughs> agreed to come. Life force, yes. Women's <laughs> life force. And yeah, and she brought Esa Westreicher, who will present us today um, a project that gives insights and in what you actually you plan for the future. So far, I, I, I think we will discuss a lot. I stop for now here. Also because um, I have the honor to announce uh, a lecture performance by Christopher Wessels, uh, who will introduce us from the perspective of an artist and a curator um, in a para-institutional practice of thinking and speaking the para-institution. So, uh, welcome Christopher Wessels. Three musings. The agency of the witness. A liturgy for the converted. Please hold hands and stand. Or please hold each other's hands and rise up. Could you repeat after me every sentence or line that starts with hack? <laughs> hack into dietary sustenance. Hack into dietary sustenance. Tradition versus health. Hack into comfort compliance. Hack into comfort compliance. Hack into the rebellious gene. Hack into doctrine. Hack into doctrine. Capitalism, the relation of free labor and slavery. Hack into the history of the bank. Hack into the history of the bank. Is beating the odds the mere act of joining the winning team? Hack into desperation and loneliness. Hack into desperation and loneliness. The history of community and the marketplace. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into business, law of proprietorship. Hack into business, law of proprietorship. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into forms of government. Hack into forms of government. The history of revolutions. The relation of suffering and sufferance. Hack into faith and morality. Hack into faith and morality. The treatment of one faith towards another. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality. What is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared. Hack into God. Hack into God. The stories of creation, serpents and eggs. Hack into coincidence. Hack into coincidence. The summer of 68, the 27th club, the number of people with Facebook profiles, people who share, people who share too much, people who seem lonely, People who want to connect, people who want to uplift, people who need uplifting. Three simple copper wires coiled around an orb, parked in an orbit. Equatorial landmines, useful and precious metals, Colton as cotton. Colton as cotton. Colton as cotton. Hack into whores. Hack into whores. Industrial digital, hack into code. Use your instrument as metaphor, hallowed to the ground, typing the mainframe, dismantle definition, dogma, and duty. Hack into the database. Hack into the database. Hold it in the subconscious. The panel marks survival. Hack into celebrity. Hack into the cultural development of taste. Hack into violence, fear, and ignorance. How are they linked? You may sit. It was a poem by Saul Williams called Colton as Cotton. My first musing will be a musing on miracles. And it's a collective musing that was done 
a musing, it's a contemplation. It's a contemplation of miracles, on miracles. And it's done collectively with a colleague of mine, Bonaventure Sobiang and Dukung, and Giovanna Esposito Yusuf. Miracles and miracle making are manifestations of the impossible. Not because the impossible is impossible, but because the impossible is thought impossible. That is, for those that exist in or accept the normalcy of what is framed as possible, as for Brali Scratch Perry, who once said, I'm a miracle man, things happen which I don't plan, I've never planned anything whatsoever I do, I wanted to be an instant action object, instant action reaction subject, instant input, instant output. The concept of the impossible seems to be rather the rule than the exception. Miracles are thus the performativity of all those concepts that have the prefix with im, in, an, or otherwise imply the contrary, the opposite, the negative of, as in impossible, invisible, inaccessible, unbelievable, unacceptable, unrecoverable. But once the miracle is performed, that is to say, once the prefix is obliterated in impossible, takes form, in these lines, one can understand the greater miracle of perception as braving what has been normalized as challenging the frames of perception and the rationale of the knowing. It implies a teleological suspension of miracle making and entails reparation of the bonds between our cognitive understandings and the plurality of knowledges and literacies through which they manifest. As such, it expands what can be perceived, experienced, done, and imagined. Miriculum is the Latin word for an object of wonder. Mirari, to wonder at, marvel, be astonished, and figuratively it means to regard, esteem. The astonishment and marvel that a young man could heal by making a blind to see, or taking control of the norms of nature by walking on water or performing a social act like sharing a loaf of bread, and fish to thousands of people. For indeed, miracle making is the act of losing one's innocence, of seeing that what is, was not meant to be seen, or being cognizant of what is not meant to be understood. So maybe the miracle is not really the act of making the blind man see, but making the onlookers to see and believe that the act of healing the blind is possible. It is crucial to underline that in order to grasp the engineering and machinery behind the performing and performance of miracles and how these impact societies, their cultures and politics, one must address how the miraculous has been plundered, sedimenting the knowledges of miracle making and turning them into dominant discourses or ideologies to maintain and justify the privilege of a few. It's been a common practice in the instrumentalizing the extraordinary. It serves to the construction and preservation of the exception and the ruled. Capitalist and colonial systems and practices have feasted on the miracles of transmutation through the transformation of bodies and land into resources that feed the exception with the aim to make believe that their realization is both miraculous and an act of what is possible while the realization of what they label as others belongs to the realm of the impossible. The word miracle has also been attached to processes of economic recovery and growth or forms of social political organization that subtract from their narratives the implications of those processes to manifest. Such is the case where I live in the Nordic model of the welfare state, result of strong social organization and collective bargaining, and more recently the Finnish education system, both have widely been mythologized 
creating such big shadows that makes it difficult to understand how they came to be and how they are currently being shattered by strong new liberal and corporocratic policies, education, and the welfare state as miracles, knowledge as miracle. Having the privilege to belong is like transforming water into wine, the miracle of privilege. Now, the question at stake is how can the epistemics and performity now, let me go on a tangent. And here, I'm going to read Kobena Mercer on Adrian Piper on page 119 of the Adrian Piper Reader. <clears throat> Performativity demands we think not in linear geometries, but rather with those of a Mobius strip. Mobius is some cartoon from Belgium. Piper unsettled the dichotomies of subject-object, active-passive, and visible-invisible in acts of discrepant embodiment that even now have the power to confound our available terms of analysis and comprehension. And here, Kobeno Mercer is talking specifically about um, the body of work known as catalysis. And catalysis, and it's... I specifically here want you to envision Catalysis 3, which is a moment where Adrian Piper in the, in the 70s, 1970 to be specific, painted her clothes in white emulsion paint with wet paint written on it and went to Macy's to buy a pair of sunglasses and some other sundries. Now, Kobena Mercer here looks at what happens? To say the beholder is empowered by not seeing is to countenance the view that contrary to the commonplace notion that seeing guarantees knowing is not knowing that is foundational to the optical politics of social privilege. The not knowing that follows from not seeing would thus be the prior condition without which neither white or male privilege would exist. Liberal humanist critiques of misrecognition have drawn attention to the injurious consequences of going unseen. I'm still quoting Kobena Mercer. But Piper was the first to show that invisibly, invisibility is interactively produced when reciprocity is withheld through the act of not looking. Piper's art, by turning into the alternative epistemologies opened by performance and operating in the realm of pre-verbal affect generated a kind of surplus knowledge that eludes the codific codification in language. And for me, this moment of, of Piper's work, what he references, is becoming aware of your role as a witness and the agency of a witness in times of change. Back to the talk. Now the question at stake is how can the epistemics and performativity of miracles be explored through the physicality of an exhibition and embodied experientiality of the peoples, artists, thinkers, musicians, visitors. If miracles are embodied spiritual, natural, philosophical, and abstract phenomena, phenomena, they are expressed in the forms of, and here I quote Irobi, proverbs, oral poetry, rap, incantation, storytelling, dance, theater, festival, ritual, and the plastic arts. These cost concepts become manifest in the transcendental phenomenology in action to both initiates and outsiders. Our aim is to explore a wide understanding of what miracles can be, ranging from the ability of making wonders to the etymological Sanskrit root, smera, or Greek root, meidan, which means smile. For the next musing, musing on jazz, there's a meditative soundtrack 
And if you wish, you could note it and listen to it in your own time as homework or as as an energy source. And the playlist is Miles Davis' So What Kind of Blue, published in 1959. Nina Simone, Don't Smoke in Bed, the live in concert, live in New York, published in 1964. Archie Sheps, The Magic of Juju, from the album The Magic of Juju, published in 1967. And Cecil Taylor, Sal Walk for Celeste, Take One, Sal Walk for Celeste, 1961. And Sun Ra and the orchestra, There's a Change in the Air, on the album Antique Blacks, published in 1978. If I could find the spot where truth echoes, I would stand there and whisper memories of my children's future. I would let their future dwell in my past so that I might live a brighter now. Now is the essence of my domain and it contains all that was and will be. And I am as I was and will be, because I am and always will be. It's the opening stanza to a, another one of Saul Williams' poems called Sha Clack Clack. And let me kick off with another quote. This time by Jacques Attali. Someone I don't really agree on, agree with, but he had some interesting thoughts on noise. Our science has always desired to monitor, measure, abstract and castrate meaning, forgetting that life is full of noise and that death alone is silent. Work noise, noise of man, and noise of beast. Noise bought, noise sold, or prohibited. Nothing essential happens in the absence of noise. Now, this is amusing on jazz and other noise. A, a musical form that has deeply influenced me is jazz. Then within jazz, it is modal jazz tradition that for me becomes the music that starts talking about other possibilities. The beauty of it lies in its very obvious homage to the blues. Thus, its acknowledgement of its struggle roots. The Oxford English Dictionary defines modal as form as opposed to substance. Modal jazz can thus be defined as jazz that uses forms of music or modes of music instead of chord progressions as a harmonic framework. Miles Davis' Kind of Blue, published in 69, and the song So What is regarded as the epitome of this modal jazz tradition. The break from Western classical music is probably the reason why it was regarded as noise, as unsophisticated. In another one of Atali's quotes, is that if one takes the conception that music noise is prophetic, then it is certainly modal jazz that ushers us into a new possibility, a new future. And Atali says, it heralds for it is prophetic. It has always been in its essence a herald of times to come, talking about music. Thus, as we see, if it is true that the political organization of the 20th century is rooted in the political thought of the 19th, the latter is almost entirely, entirely present in embryonic form in the music of the 18th century. Sissel, I'm searching. What does your atonality suggest? with its butchering and deconstruction of old melodies, reinventing them to give new meaning, other meaning. Soloists improvising to redefine sound, the rest of the ensemble waiting in the wings, keeping the ship steady, sure of its form, not sure of where it will end. It is modal jazz, if modal jazz represents a new beginning, in the conception and expression of Western music, then it is Sun Ra and his orchestra with a cacophony of dissonance, warning us of our cognitive dissonance in time and space. Then it is Archie Shep, who through free jazz, brings jazz back to its maternal home of resistance, breaking the shackles of capitalist patriarchy that has so successfully commodified and captured the spirit of change that this music was, is, and will demands or is demanding. If it is the polytonality of modal jazz that for me becomes a tool 
that I want to use to explore the practice of noise. The tonality of music, essentially the arrangement of chords to create a perceived hierarchy of perceived relations, stabilities and attractions. Polytonality then is essentially a cacophony or many hierarchies of stabilities and attractions. Noise needs to seek to subvert these hierarchies, while at the same time to amplify the poly nature of things. It needs to constantly be in a position where it is in a rehearsal of rebellion. It must crack the dome that colonizes our mind. Countering the normative needs to be its starting point as it blasts through our stratosphere, taking us into space where the impossible is considered because we know what's possible. Borders must be challenged. Ambiguities and paradoxes must be encouraged. It needs to help us experience those temporary moments of emancipation, for the journey to freedom is long, because we do not yet know what freedom is. It comes and it goes. It must help us rethink risk and help us reimagine risk in its non-economic determinist manifestations because on our march to freedom, it is risks we must take. It needs to help us decolonize our bodies and decolonize our minds. We need to breathe in and out. It needs to take us out of our elitist bubbles and help us unlearn our privilege as a loss. We need to rethink the margins as the center and move towards the conception of the center for the study of the impossible and the musing of impossible forms. If I could find the spot where truth echoes, I would stand there and whisper memories of my children's future. I would let their future dwell in my past, so that I might live a brighter now. Now is the essence of my domain, and it contains all that was and will be. And I am as I was and will be, because I am and always will be. That is the opening stanza of a poem by Saul Williams called Shaklak Clack. Third musing is a musing on cinema. According to Lewis Gordon, reasonability can embrace contradictions. In fact, he argues that it must do so in order to evaluate itself, and this leads to his conclusion that the scope of reason, quote, exceeds rationality, end quote. We know that in the production of cinema, the disciplines that collaborate are in a constant conversation and constant consideration, but we also know that this considered relationality is governed by a deeply entrenched hierarchy. So at its core, the act of disciplinary disobedience is the fracturing and disillusion of hierarchy and exploring the potentiality of a constant conversation and consideration without it. Thus, to sincerely realize a reason that exceeds rationality, it is imperative to venture into the realm of the conception and the realization of miracles within the ensemble of the collective. Rethinking, being, becomes foundational in the realization of the impossible. So understanding that the production of cinema in its essence is a collaborative exercise, by using the cinematic as method for exploring miracles or the impossible, the object is not the realization of a film, but the exploration of a broader ecosystem or community that blossoms around the process. This is partly a contestation to the hierarchical structures manifesting as ontological within the production of cinema. It is about developing ways of contesting the everyday, using the space of cinema to explore those impossibilities. How does this process of recreating miracles in cinema, for example, Pio Pasolini's levitating woman in the film Theorema, help in nurturing ways of contestation? How does one rehearse dismantling impossibility through the practice of cinema? And how does this help in the dismantling of other impossibilities of the everyday? Please hold hands and rise up. Again, repeat 
every word, every sentence that starts with hack. Hack into dietary sustenance. Hack into dietary sustenance. Tradition versus health. Hack into comfort compliance. Hack into, comfort compliance. Hack into the rebellious gene. Hack into, the gene. Hack into doctrine. Capitalism, the relation of free labor and slavery. Hack into the history of the bank. Hack into the history of the bank. Is beating the odds the mere act of joining the winning team. Hack into desperation and loneliness. Hack into desperation and loneliness. The history of community and the marketplace. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into business. Hack into business. Law of proprietorship. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into forms of government. Hack into forms of government. The history of revolutions. The relation of suffering and sufferance. Hack into faith and morality. Hack into faith and morality. The treatment of one faith toward another. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality. Hack into masculinity, femininity, and sexuality. What is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared. Hack into God. Stories of creation, serpents and eggs. Hack into coincidence. Hack into coincidence. The summer of 68. The 27th club. The number of people with Facebook profiles. People who choose to share. People who share too much. People who seem lonely. People who want to connect. People who want to uplift. People who need uplifting. Three simple copper wires coiled around an orb. Parked in an orbit. Equatorial landmines, useful and precious metals, Colton as cotton. Colton as cotton. Colton as cotton. Hack into whores. Hack into whores. Industrial digital. Hack into, code. Hack into code. Use your instrument as metaphor. Hello to the ground. Type into the mainframe. Dismantle definition, dogma, and duty. Hack into the database. Hold it in the subconscious. The panel marked survival. Hack into celebrity. Hack into the cultural development of taste. Hack into violence. Fear and ignorance. How are they linked? Before you sit down, as a footnote. So Saul Williams in the opening stanza to the poem Shaklak Clack places the reader smack bang into some schizo temporality. He yearns for the spot where truth echoes, a space of sorts, and imagines space in the real. He questions the possibility of truth, inferring an impossibility in his quest for it, but that does not stop him. He, through his poetry, defies our knowledge of time and space to talk about a now and an imagined future unknown. I would stand there and whisper memories of my children's future, endeavoring for us, the audience, listener, reader, to develop a sensitivity to his subjectivity. You may sit. Oh, I've even prepared a hymn. So um, we'll sing a song. It's going to be karaoke. Can everybody see the screen? Okay. I need to make the screen bigger. This is that uncomfortable moment where you can talk to each other. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll, I'll lead, but you guys are, are welcome to sing along, obviously. Um, it's a karaoke, and um, I've been practicing this with my children, just to kind of now get it right. 
my daughter thinks I should I should go, go to idols. <laughs> um, but she, she just likes me. I think she, there's a partiality. Okay. So, so, a song by John Lennon called Working Class Hero. As soon as you're born, they make you feel small. By giving you no time instead of it all. Pain is so big, you feel nothing at all. A working class hero is something to be. A working class hero is something to be. They hurt you at home and they hit you at school. They hate you if you're clever and despise a fool. Till you're so fucking crazy you can't follow their rules. A working class hero is something to be. A working class hero is something to be. When they've tortured and scared you for 20 odd years Then they expect you to pick a career When you can't really function, you're so full of fear Here's hope A working class hero is something to be I wanted to go discount, but I can't really do it. A working class hero is something to be. Keep you doped with religion and sex and TV. And you think you're so clever and classless and free. But you're still fucking peasants as far as I can see. A working class hero is something to be. A working class hero is something to be. There's a room at the top they are telling you still. But first you must learn how to smile as you kill If you want to be like the folks on the hill A working class hero is something to be A working class hero is something to be uh, this is where I disagree with John Lennon a bit, and I suppose um, Tina Turner becomes more relevant. Thank you. After this um, para prayer that we heard, um, we decided to just go on with the presentations and have then a discussion of all together. And um, I am I'm really happy that uh, Elena and Elsa agreed to introduce us a bit also in some concrete projects that you have done and that you will do so that we have something concrete on the table. Just to tell you how I see this could go. So on the one hand, it is of course about presentations and we also, people have really thought about how to think about autonomy. Um, on the other hand, it would be really nice in the following discussion to link it to the very concrete situation in which we are here now. But first of all, 
Um, I am very happy to give the word to Elena Agudio from Savi Contemporary in Berlin. Thanks a lot. So first of all, yes, I want to uh, thank uh, Nora a lot for inviting us in such a relevant discussion, but I also want to thank uh, Chris because, I, th I mean, he, you left me speechless, uh, so I hope I will manage to talk because I'm, I'm somehow moved uh, by your intervention. So when invited to reflect on, uh, um, on, on Savi as an institution, an institution that is since its beginning uh, questioning itself and understanding itself as something in, a, um, in um, a structure in constant becoming, of course we've also been addressing um, the concept of autonomy. Um, as uh, um, Chantal Mouffe uh, has been uh, um, uh, claiming and explaining in uh, the seminar article called uh, Institutions at Site of Organistic Interventions, um, there are <coughs> two possibilities to address uh, the reality and to challenge this, the neoliberal um, system in which we are finding ourselves, uh, ourselves embedded in. Uh, there is a strategy of Withdrawal, so withdrawing, uh, withdrawing uh, with uh, from the institutions and finding uh, using critical artistic practice uh, to engage uh, um, um, uh, disentangling uh, yourself from the institution uh, and trying to ch to create another um, reality. Or there is a strategy of engagement with the institution, trying to enter and even parasite, um, as a parasite, uh, uh, attacking the institution and changing it from within. So I think um, here the conversation with you, um, Nora, could exactly also be tackled in this way because both uh, possibilities, I think, are very relevant and you are doing that and many other people are doing that choosing to work from within the institution uh, and trying to... Um, yeah. I mean, beside and beyond, yes. neither within nor outside. Exactly. But in our case, uh, when Savi Contemporary was founded in uh, 2008 by Bonaventure, um, uh, the idea was really to be uh, not even beside, but at the beginning was really being beyond because there was no uh, support, uh, no financial, no structural, nobody could um, um, support the choice of Bonaventure to create, to create this extra space, this extra territory where he could develop his, uh, um, his agency and his uh, positions and his resistance. So um, maybe as well, uh, we decided that Elsa was tackling a little bit uh, also the concept of autonomy and then we want of course to also explain how we're working concretely in practice, how we are a performative space uh, um, reflecting on uh, uh, autonomy, on uh, how uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, the fact that we are collaborating and receiving fundings from um, public uh, institutions is affecting our practice and how we are dealing with uh, with these issues. So let's uh, have uh, Elsa starting and then we will ping pong a little bit and then we will introduce uh, um, a project that will start soon in 2000, end of 2018 and 2019. And this is actually the first uh, uh, school project that we are uh, activating at Savi, a school project that of course is also trying to undo uh, and, uh, um, and challenge the idea of what a school is. And of course, a school that is completely independent from any academic realm, but that is stemming from within within um, Savvy Contemporary and from within our experience and our, our practice. So yes, let's start with you and then we continue ping pong. Yeah? Great, perfect. So again, also thank you very, very much for inviting us, Nora. It's a really a great pleasure and also honor. Um, and yes, so, uh, you know, with this amazing, beautiful title, um, you know, that is also very complex, we kind of started to ask ourselves, whoops, is this showing? No. no. Um, yes, yes, it's showing. You okay. cannot see it because Good. you are on this side. Um, anyway, so 
uh, yeah, so we kind of uh, were invited on the basis of, um, of, you know, a couple of sentences which, you know, already led to uh, really quite a few questions um, because, again, the sentence was also very complex. So um, um, you can read it in the program, but I'll quickly read it out to you as well. Um, with the Museum of Impossible Forms Helsinki and Savi Contemporary Berlin, we will encounter two para-institutions, uh, laboratories aiming to share ideas that might not exist yet, places where we could learn together what we don't know yet. What does all this mean in relation to the university and to the Kunsthochschule, et cetera? I won't get into detail with this. But so even when we have the first sentence, um, you know, <laughs> In a way, the, the question revolves around even the term para institution and somehow the hidden expectations that are in this sentence. Um, because, you know, somehow you, the audience, uh, are promised to encounter two para institutions. Uh, and to be, I, I think Chris did a really good job at sort of performing it himself here. Um, and we feel probably more as representatives of Savi Contemporary and somehow will try to you know, get an idea across of who we are. Um, but I can't promise that this works out, we'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and if, you know, and if Savi Contemporary is a para-institution, then beside what exactly is it? And beyond what exactly is it? Uh, beside and beyond the status quo of traditional established institutions, uh, beside and beyond generally accepted knowledge systems or generally accepted practices of knowledge, thought sharing, uh, beside and beyond the socio-political status quo, beside beyond usual ways of commoning, or beside uh, usual neg negotiated frameworks, or maybe even all of that. Um, then the next question comes uh, from uh, another part of the sentence, uh, which is, what can one think as ideas that might not exist yet? You know, in the sense that don't all ideas that we share already exist in one form or another? Might this question not actually ask for ideas that exist and have existed for millennia, but were violently silenced, willfully ignored, or even slaughtered? And if you already mentioned these circumstances, are they still treated this way? Is this the beside and beyond that we talk about when we talk about para? And is that realm that, be, uh, that can be called para because it tries to encounter this violence by digging deep into these existing, non-existent ideas and thereby prove Western supremacist thinking and doing wrong? Um, and here we already get to that we, you know, that very complicated we. Uh, which we? I mean, what, which we are we even talking about? What assumptions does this we put, uh, do we, put into that we? Uh, who is included in that we and who is excluded? When I think about this, um, I sometimes dearly hope that Freud was wrong when he said as, um, that a we only emerges in contrast or opposition to a them, um, to the construction of an other. But what if we already are, um, if we are already othering when we define the stereotyped Western supremacist as this other? And what if that other is actually included in that we? Uh, what if that Western supremacist is maybe not only our family, but even maybe ourselves? Uh, many occasions here to get paranoid. Or actually, might that idea of para as beside and beyond even yield some kind of hope for a kind of transitionary phase, where the other is not the opposition, but as Nora points out, the beside. That which we live in despite our wishes and desires and that which we hope to change. Hope to change by way of unlearning the untruth of Western supremacy and stepping up against its lies. So here, when we talk about learning together what we don't know yet, which is also taken from the sentence, it may rather be about unlearning what one, not we, thinks one knows, and maybe simply wonder. And this is kind of like a parallel to what you were saying too with the miracle. Uh, so, to say in a, so to say that we find ourselves in some kind of limb of knowledge, but that there maybe we can actually um, find something else that can emerge. Um, so that something else may well be a presence in form of an institution, uh, you know, something existing in situ, uh, so to say, um, a presence performing its own existence, uh, and that struggles to afford its autonomy, that struggles in a sense to afford its capacity to play with its own rules on an individual basis, but also in relation to other institutions, that perform this openly, publicly, but also in thousands of emails, meetings, and phone calls. 
So I think this is a good moment to start uh, a slideshow that we prepared, uh, which will sort of function as a kind of invocation of Savi Contemporary. Um, and I'll pass, and in the meantime, pass the word to Elena to maybe elaborate a bit on what kind of space we are. Yes. So, um, Savi Contemporary is defining itself as a space for conviviality. Um, meaning uh, that Savi Contemporary is considering itself an open space where, I mean, our doors are always opening and we are always waiting for people to come in and engage in conversation, engage even, having even arguments with us for sitting together, cooking together, reading together um, and uh, um, drinking together. Um, uh, the idea of conviviality has also brought us to reflect and think on the notion of hospitality. And actually, recently, a um, few weeks ago, we closed uh, uh, an exhibition project uh, um, that we um, realized uh, working for more than a year on, on uh, um, the contemplating on the notion of hospitality. So trying to, under to understand how many layers of hostility are hidden in practices of hospitality and how to um, uh, analyze the contemporary um, uh, scene and the contemporary politics uh, uh, of uh, in, in regards to uh, migration uh, politics, etc., with uh, more uh, critical eye. Um, um, Savi Contemporary is also a space for um, epistemological diversity. This is something that we are always uh, stressing and that's something that we always stress also through the use and the um, maintenance and growing of our archive, the library you have been talking about, uh, Nora. Um, a space the, uh, where we can try to uh, defend uh, um, a common ground where different positions can democratically debate uh, social meaning, but also a space where um, different disciplines uh, can talk to each other. We talk about extra disciplinarity usually, but also people with different background, different uh, social biographical, um, educational, um, um, different background are coming together and trying to perform um, um, togetherness, of course, with also all, uh, um, all the challenges, all the contradictions, all uh, the, um, antagoni the yeah, antagonism that have to, to be unfolded. Um, of course, uh, uh, Savi Contemporary is a space for unlearning, as, uh, as uh, Elsa said. We have been doing um, um, even a, a big project on the concept of uh, unlearning, uh, where we, together actually with fundings from uh, um, the Ausvertikesamt, so of course also trying to understand and uh, um, to question how to, uh, to, to relate, how to uh, maybe use the support uh, from um, uh, public uh, fundings, but of course uh, how completely to, to remain uh, free and not to serve it. Uh, I, want, I wanted to say uh, how to use it but not to serve it because I've, I've been having a conversation um, before this panel discussion with uh, Ulfa Minde, um, who is a professor um, at uh, Weissense uh, Kunsthochschule and is also leading uh, and he conceived uh, and is uh, directing this foundation class. Uh, this class, actually, Marcus Aviv is also here and is also teaching in the, in the class uh, with me. Um, I've been having such an interesting conversation because he was also um, explaining how his understanding uh, a project like foundation class uh, as uh, a a possibility um, uh, to uh, uh, work from within the institution but using it and uh, uh, not serving it. And also how this foundation class is for him a sort of a parasite uh, and a place where opacity also can be performed. So he said that it's very important to, 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 to keep, to understand and reanalyze also the concept of opacity, applying it to um, institutions, how para institutions should uh, maintain a certain opacity and ambiguity, you also said that uh, in your lecture performance, uh, to be able to perform their autonomy also. 
So um, another important, um, I, we have also some slides with all these keywords. Mm -hmm. Maybe it yeah. was uh, yeah. nice to, because I'm just throwing some concepts so that then we can tackle, um, tackle them in a discussion, in an open discussion. I guess not everybody is familiar with what uh, Savi does. Uh, so uh, I'm just uh, giving these keywords. Uh, so another thing is, of course, uh, um, intersectionality. Um, we, uh, I can speak uh, more precisely about that from uh, uh, the perspective of a project that I'm uh, co-curating with other two colleagues at Save. It's a series on uh, um, feminisms, and of course, uh, feminisms uh, said in plural. What happens? Ah, you're checking if the it slides is there. Work. It doesn't work. Okay. Or maybe because it's too it's too dark, it's black, so you cannot really see it. Ah, it's, I think it's yeah. there, but it's yeah. very, very dark now. Yes. Um, a project whose title is uh, uh, We Who Are Not the Same, and it, which is understanding uh, difference as, as a force, uh, of course. Uh, difference uh, as uh, a concept that is stemming from uh, um, feminist uh, theory and practice. But also, we, and, and it's also um, a title that is uh, quoting Adrian Rich. Uh, um, it's a sentence from uh, her towards a, politic, a new politic of location. Um, and we are trying not only to uh, acknowledge our our difference, but to to really make it productive and to work with it. So we are, uh, since uh, now more than more a year and a half, uh, we have been putting together a series of exercises. So uh, collectively exercising, um, inviting uh, artists, activists, uh, uh, thinkers. Uh, to sit together with us and find ways of uh, creating new alliances, creating these possibilities of uh, uh, solidarity uh, that of course are for us uh, very important. And I think on that note, um, I would also like to say that um, when uh, uh, reflecting about the concept of um, autonomy, um, I have been, uh, I and, and, and we in general at Savi, have been really um, thinking that for us, uh, um, autonomy can just be conceived uh, as a relational autonomy. And I think also when we're talking about para institution and we are seeing ourselves uh, um, in a constellation like the one of today, um, the first uh, uh, thing that we should really claim is the fact that we are not being independent from, uh, uh, yeah, we can be independent from some certain power structures, but we have to understand the force of being interconnected and interdependent. And these um, entanglements that, are, that happened very naturally also, because we got uh, uh, in contact with, with Chris uh, a long time ago already. We have other spaces, for example, Chiasma in Paris, directed by Olivier Marboeuf, uh, and of course, uh, many other um, institutions and para-institutions across the globe, and especially in the global, in the global south as well. Um, that, hmm? Yeah, please. Oh, you say raw material company. Raw material as well, but also smaller, smaller institutions that are really trying to reimagine the impossible because that's really <laughs> the main thing. Um, uh, but uh, that are able to support support each other in this uh, constellation of uh, um, of solidarity. So. Uh, I think this is also some material for, for the discussion, uh, but I want to continue also saying that uh, um, we are also understanding uh, the importance of uh, uh, um, relational autonomy, considering the fact that uh, um, autonomy has been used, uh, especially in, uh, during uh, modern times, uh, when uh, um, uh, the idea of uh, the individuum, of the self uh, uh, build man uh, um, was being built. Uh, of course, this idea was uh, an exclusive idea, an idea of uh, uh, the white bourgeois man uh, that is being able to perform its, uh, her, his autonomy because uh, there was 
a protective a pro uh, an areas and an other realm of care of reproductive labor that was performed at home that was performed by uh, by 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 women or not for sure or, or by by other people that were not the middle class uh, uh, white uh, bourgeois men um, and in that sense uh, uh, at savvy contemporary we are also um, insisting on the importance of uh, giving value to reproductive labor, uh, emotional labor, uh, when we are uh, doing events, even just talking from a very practical um, perspective, we have a set, a constellation of people uh, that are really always taking care of our guests, taking care of, of the people in the audience that are cooking, that are sharing. And we find that not only um, a background uh, um, uh, infrastructure, but we find uh, um, that these things are, are, are extremely important uh, as, uh, um, and are, are part of our, our concept. So uh, this relationality. Then another thing that is, of course, very crucial for us and that it's very important for me as an art historian is uh, uh, the decanonization. So we are trying to uh, not only unlearn uh, our privileges, uh, but also unlearn uh, our educational uh, background, especially me uh, as few other people, we are not many because we are coming really from different uh, places uh, in the world, but me as an Italian uh, white uh, art historian, I've been going through a long process of uh, deconstruction, of uh, uh, unlearning, and uh, this idea of trying to decanonize de de uh, um, uh, our baggage, of course, is not an easy, an easy path. Eh? But talking about unlearning our privilege, we thought that at least half an hour we should yes. have for discussion. Exactly. So I didn't check the time. That's yeah. why I'm so just now talking. So now it's only, I think, seven minutes left, left until three. And I think Elsa also want to present school. Oh, right. So could yes. you just or sum up or is, is fine? That's, that's fine because me, I was just talking for you and I didn't check the time, I'm I sorry. I was, uh, exactly, <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to stop me. Great. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so yes, the project I'll, I'll quickly talk about is, um, is basically, as Ellen already pointed out, uh, a school that we are creating uh, in the end of 2000. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Oh yeah, that's closer um, so the uh, what Elena was already mentioning is that we are creating a school um, at Savi Contemporary and it's actually going to be some kind of school of design um, and it's uh, on the occasion of the hundredth anniversary of the Bauhaus and so uh, what really uh, is the you know the Bauhaus is, is obviously a very complex topic um, and especially when one talks about it from a from a savvy contemporary perspective which of course also has to tackle uh, the kind of neo-colonial structures and colonial structures that are embedded in uh, design practice uh, today so um, as the project doesn't exist yet and we only have a concept I'll just quite uh, read you a couple of like one or two uh, paragraphs from this concept which I hope makes the idea of the school clear. Um, if we were to take, uh, so we are, we basically, Savi Contemporary takes up this founding moment of a school. Um, so 1919 is that uh, we, like Germany celebrates the, you know, the founding of the school in 1919. And so we are celebrating in 2019 um, the fact that maybe we need to find a, found another school. Um, so if we were to take up this founding moment and its central question, what consequences would this have in the now, i.e. the now of its hairs? thinking of us as heirs of the Bauhaus uh, in the sense that we live in a Bauhaus world. How does a space like Savvy Contemporary, the laboratory form ideas with its eight years of questioning the existing power structures and the structural racism inherent to our societies and educational systems respond to the central question of what kind of future and what kind of future for us, i.e. all of us? How would it further its experience as a performative space to act against it? If we would postulate a new school of design 100 years after the Bauhaus, from which place and through which gesture? The answer is from the sky-high rubble heap. And that's a reference, obviously, to uh, Benjamin's um, on the concept of history. Through the gesture of spinning the triangle, flipping the hourglass. 
setting a seemingly stable hierarchist form into motion, speeding it up, changing its outline, dizzying its content, challenging its conception of present, past and future. Because we know, as others have already also stated, that the starting point needs to be made beyond established structures from scratch with an agenda that dares to think progress and future beyond their Western conceptions. Meaning by leaping forwards backwards and throwing that sky high rubble heap in front of us because this rubble heap is physically real. It is, has not disappeared to some distant past forever behind that angel of history. It has just been consciously kept at a distance, somewhere else, somewhere other. It is just not located in the metropolitan centers of the geopolitical West, not where the so-called creative industries are located, where the apparent idea hubs and future labs find their settings. The rubble heap has been outsourced, left to be dealt with by others, who in fact are us, meaning all of us. If we are to follow this, arg um, no, one second. Um, yet design and education, discourse and practice is at the very core of modern design is neglected in design studies and design histories despite efforts being made. Border voices are often ignored altogether and rarely enter the stage on their own terms. If Sabi Contemporary repeats the founding moment of 1919, a new school needs to be created, one that transfers border epistemologies into making. We want uh, a new, school de uh, new design school to enter the life world, a prototype that could spark a new kind of knowledge transfer, capable of generating new principles and therefore new forms of making everyday life and co-living. Where else and within a country where the sky-high rubble heap of history has amassed six million corpses in recent modernity alone, meaning the last 20 years, from 1996 to 2016 where the mining of minerals to feed our electronic apparatuses goes hand in hand with the slaughtering of the population of an entire region of the earth now. The location we want to propose is the Democratic Republic of the Congo and in within the DRC, Kinshasa, its capital. Here, actors of the extremely lively and thriving art and design scene will dedicate themselves to the founding of a school. A school that challenges common formats and pedagogies from scratch on their own terms, corresponding to their philosophies, ideas, histories and needs. So that's from the concept, uh, and it will come into being, hopefully. I mean, it does come into being, not Maybe hopefully. you can explain that it's conceived between Berlin, Kinshasa, and Hong yeah. Kong. I mean, uh, yeah, well, I could talk about the structure of the project a bit more, uh, which, so basically we, um, we depart in Berlin um, and then go to uh, Hong Kong. Um, with a tiny house university um, uh, that is, uh, was founded by Van Bo, a designer who thinks a lot about urban space and about how to actually live in a world that, uh, you know, has less and less space for more and more people. Um, and so we are going to ask um, questions about urbanity also in Hong Kong and then, um, and then we are traveling to Kinshasa. And um, there we will have uh, different people, uh, largely from the global south, to get into a south-south discussion about w what uh, kind of alternative formats um, have already worked, um, have, have been able to sustain themselves, because obviously it's often a question of sustenance, um, and uh, just create some a hub of um, uh, you know, idea sharing between them. So in a way that's already a, f uh, a way of uh, knowledge, knowledge sharing, uh, because in a way even, I don't even like to talk about it very much as a school, because I think even the term school already has some kind of prefixed ideas attached to it. Um, so it's more about thinking, okay, what is a school really? And if it's about knowledge transfer between people, then how can that be conceived in a different way? Uh, and somehow I found that also really interesting what you performed, Chris, because that was a, like, you know, like uh, the reminiscence of like church, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sermons. And in a way that's also a form of knowledge transfer that can be changed and appropriated for another, for other ideas uh, or for opening up discourses somehow. Um, so that's what we're interested in, and um, when the school, um, when uh, when the school is developed um, over there in Kinshasa, then it is also going to travel to Berlin um, and be located there for one month, and will be active um, at Savi Contemporary f uh, in the month of July. Yes, yeah, thanks a lot, um, and thank.
thanks to all of you for staying with us and listening to us while we performed the para-institution of the panel discussion, <laughs> having a lot to say. Um, Sti yet, it seems important to relate what has been said to the concrete situation because I understand this whole symposium also as an intervention in a very concrete situation. So from here, I would just open, but feel free, if you feel I don't want to relate to the concrete, I just have a question, please. Just address whatever you need to address um, and the floor is yours now. Uh, how does it work with the mic? Shall I run with that one? Can I? No? Yeah. This one. Yeah, the other one. I could, I could do it. Right. So, um, yeah. Um, my name is Amelie. I study here at the uh, art school and I also work for Documenta. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the, um, uh, the, the grammar and um, vocabulary of Savi, which I think is not the, the case for everyone. Um, and um, I want to uh, talk about two very personal anecdotes to relate this more to the very specific context, um, which is not, maybe it's not relating to the art school, but maybe I will come to this. So um, before I came here, to the symposium, um, like one week ago, I was super, uh, I was in a really s a strong internal fight with myself because I have a very strong urge or need to discuss very theoretically and abstractly about things that interest me. But <laughs> at, the very <laughs> at the very same time, uh, the, I also have an emotional need to connect with people. Um, and. I, I think that these things sometimes uh, are so far apart because I also see that, I mean, you read a lot of written text and it wasn't read in a, in a way that there was enough pause to understand what you were actually saying. Um, so, um, not, not like, um, I think it, I mean, for me, I can only uh, talk about myself and also English is not my mother tongue. So, um, and still I can take a lot with me because I know the language and the grammar and uh, also metaphorically. Um, but also I feel super bad and I have a bad conscious, uh, how do you say conscious? Yeah, I, I feel bad, I just feel bad because I know that so many people can't join me in this discussion or thought or you. And um, I wonder, um, also my first experience, and this is my second anecdote. So my first was my struggle about coming here and now I'm here and I'm enjoying it. Um, and my second anecdote is uh, when I first came to Savi, um, th um, there was a really big text um, book about what was going on. And it was in a very academic language, which I, uh, I somehow can also speak because uh, when I, now I come back to the art school, because uh, here in the art school, you don't, um, it's, there's not a very big theoretical curriculum and you don't learn how to perform academically as a, as a module that you have to attend. So, um, and I only learned it because I parallelly studied at the, the university sociology, because I kind of felt, okay, I, there's a, a vocabulary being used that I can't access and I feel dumb. And I don't feel like, I, I don't know how to yeah, connect with these people. And now I'm, I'm kind of like, I can connect, but I know that there are these people that were me before. And so I'm like in this constant st struggle and I can totally understand and relate. But at the same time, I, I ask myself, how can we um, open this up? Hmm? How can we hack elitism and truth? Yeah, and how can we, I mean, even at this point, I, I'm sure some people left this discussion because they couldn't follow. They, they didn't feel like entirely invited enough. And maybe there's still the, the point of, uh, of saying, okay, this is totally normal because actually, if we, be on, uh, if we are honest, it's a very specific uh, vocabulary and you can't understand it if you don't have experience with this certain context. So, yeah. Yes. So. So. Thank you. So I think um, in, I, I really take it seriously, this um, part of the prayer where 
I repeated that I would like to hack elitism and greed. Um, and in this, in this very context, I see it as all, in somehow also all of our work to do it. Um, and, and, and to clearly, and I, I, now I pray, but I cannot help myself, and to clearly, um, not, and to clearly say I don't have to decide between these two my desires. Yes. Mm. My desire to know, my desire to be with others, and my desire not to exclude people from what I want to do. J I just don't have to decide be between these three desires. I can totally live all of them. This would be kind of my para-institutional um, kind of wish or hope or horizon. But is a lot, and, and, and this is not something we can just perform so easily, is a lot of work to do to come there. And I hope that we can do it a bit together also. But I'm silent mm -hmm. now, uh, and I'm just taking in Can you in also whatever. react, or you, we want to react at I the just, end? I would just like now to some people to yeah. speak, to have a bit more, if, if there is a need or desire. Um, yes, I try to write it a bit down so I don't rumble so much. Um, uh, yeah, specifically about the question that uh, Savi posed of uh, how to use and not to serve the state. Uh, this is a question that is not directly uh, posed from me to you, but uh, we have a similar space in Mexico City and it's a question that has been posed to us that I feel I am not really able to answer in its entirety and I would like to have thoughts on it. Which is like how, because it's very, like it activates the thought to just pose this question, but how specifically do you feel you are using and not serving the the state or the 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 capital, the financing, when you have a space that is so well behaved and so fitting to the um, ideals of neoliberalism, this kind of ideals of everybody is welcome, everybody can be part of the free market, and uh, it does not really deconstru deconstruct the power of the state, but it rather reinforces this neoliberal common sense that uh, societal initiative is rendering uh, the power of the state obsolete, while at the same time the power of the state is becoming more and more powerful, like getting militarized police and getting weapons all over the world. And so it seems like a hard question to me. <laughs> like how specifically is it deconstructing the state? Thank you very much for this very concrete question. Difficult. Are there more? Yes. Hi, I would be interested, do you have an idea why the foreign ministry uh, choose you to get money from this side? And why, for instance, a German school, uh, already established school, is not part of a, a collaboration with Kinshasa? So what is the expectation you will uh, fulfill? Okay. Yeah. I think now three big questions. I think it's Should I answer now directly? I or think it, it could be good okay. now because if not, we will we forget. forget. Be very okay. So uh, I can't answer the first question because, of course, I don't know what exactly their decision is. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's so the, the money comes from the Kulturstiftung des Bundes uh, or the large part of it. Um, so, I mean, we don't, we don't have any, you know, we, we don't know why they chose our project. It's difficult for us it's to. It's Kulturstiftung, exactly. No, it's Kulturstiftung des Bundes. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, about the AA, I would, maybe I would also like to say something in a second. But uh, so the other question about why not a collaboration with an existing school? Actually, we are doing this. Um, I forgot this to mention this in my, you know, being uh, quite excited to talk. <laughs> um, is that we are collaborating actually with Ulfa Minde from the foundation class in uh, Weissensee. Uh, there is a collaboration going on there, 
and the way it's framed, uh, yeah, with the way it's framed is because he is also in this idea of the foundation class, we, he already questions what a foundation for design doing and thinking even is. So in that sense, it fits really well to, um, to what we are trying to do, but we are not working within his institution. All we are, we, we are uh, what the collaboration will be that the five teachers that we uh, that will come to Berlin will also teach one day per week over there. So in a sense, it will be an exchange. Um, and who knows? I mean, in a way, like what I would love to see is that actually there's a real exchange happening after that, that maybe connections are made, uh, you know, over there with here uh, to, um, to really engage with the conversation on a really long term. But, uh, you know, we're starting, like we're really at the starting point with this. So, yes. Um, More answers to the three questions or points yes. that were made? Yes, of course, uh, um, answering your, your question about the complexity of our language, of our vocabulary, it's, it's very important. And of course, we are uh, very much aware of that. Um, I want to say that at Savi, we try to keep this, we don't want to compromise with the level of complexity and we want to keep these layers of complexity alive. Of course, uh, this vocabulary might, might seem abstract when it's detached uh, from uh, the, the experience of our activities, of our space in itself. Uh, but when you are uh, physically coming into the space, you are uh, um, attending, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the performance, the, the program, and you're uh, engaging with the archive and talking to the people. This complexity is being disentangled. It's becoming, um, it's becoming physical, real, and you can grasp it and you can understand it much better. We always talk about the importance of situated knowledge, the importance of embodiment. So. Of course, uh, uh, it's impossible to disentangle, uh, to disentangle um, uh, the theory from the practice uh, and uh, the vocabulary from the body and the physical presence and engagement with Savi as a space. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it's very important uh, uh, to, to keep in mind what you said, but really we are quite um, aware of that. And uh, as I said, I think really it's it's important to find, we always also talking about the importance of language and also of pigization. So we think uh, we have also to go beyond the use of uh, uh, the, the, the colonial languages and to find, but also it's a metaphor to say we can find new terms, new languages, new, um, um, uh, new, a new form, a new vocabulary, uh, because we're talk still talking about the impossible, so we need to find the right words to make the impossible happen and sometimes can be cryptic Some sometimes we're using words like uh, I don't know uh, in the concept uh, of uh, on host typicality that we had uh, we even coined a word called uh, host -tipi capitalism and people can get completely lost of course uh, uh, just reading this uh, even unpronounceable words, uh, but then there is a real um, um, uh, thought behind it and a real uh, engagement with the practice. And so I think that's what makes the difference. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe, I mean, I obviously can't speak for Savi Contemporary, but in terms of capital's ability to appropriate, yes. I mean, we. We, we understand that and we and we're constantly aware of that kind of contradiction and also I mean so I haven't really spoken much about what I've done before the Museum of Impossible Forms but I've I was part of a was founding another space called Third Space in Finland which was um, a self-funded space um, or a collective and for us a, a big debate while I was part of that space was how we of what what we called like the new liberal wet dream of like, you know, artists will just take care of themselves. We don't have to fund them. Um, and, and our kind of complicity in that. So, I mean, one, one's kind of constantly aware of how our strategies can be appropriated. And I mean, capital has a rich history um, in doing that. Um, the art world, the, 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 the white cube has a, has, a, has a long history of kind of like neutralizing radicality. Um, um, so, us at the Museum of Impossible Forms are, are constantly kind of aware of that and, and thinking around it. But you know, 
for us, it also mustn't become something that paralyzes us because a lot of what we do is things that have to be done. If they're not done, it just leads to a, a, a perpetuation of other kind of um, um, structural problems and, 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 and a, 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 a stagnation of, of thinking within specific kind of a conceptual um, 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 discursive formations. One um, tiny thing is also sometimes uh, about, you know, the kind of language that we use. I also want to say, you know, maybe, I mean, in a sense, we've all been in that situation or at least, I mean, talking, not all, but talking for myself, I can just say I've been in that situation when I started to study where I was like, I do not understand anything of what I'm trying to read. And I'm a graphic designer. I'm not a theoretician at all. I'm a practice, like I'm a practi practicing graphic designer. So for me, I mean, for me, myself, I felt the need, of course, also to engage with these concepts, to engage with this kind of, you know, with this kind of uh, thinking and talking about things, but not everyone has to. And I think uh, Elena mentioned, but I think in our space, of course, now we're sitting here, we're in a certain context also where we feel have a way to maybe use this language somehow um, but there are moments you know we come into the space everyone is really welcome there's food almost every day um, have a coffee like and it's like then it's like more about something you know it's not about it's yeah it's much more approachable than maybe this concept that you read you know in in our exhibition space that you really have to take time to understand and but that's also one thing like taking time and that's also you know, when we think about neoliberal and capitalist systems, like taking time to actually read something like this and not have an Instagram one second, uh, I understand it immediately thing is I think very important and we need to keep these spaces. We need to keep spaces where this kind of knowledge production and time engagement is possible, I think. Okay, so um, the, what the time tells us is that we now half of our, le more than half of our discussion time is gone. We have 12 more minutes. So the, I'm sorry that I have to kind of make rules of the game, but in order to make it good for us, what I propose is that um, we, again we will go that way, but we will take everyone and then final round on the final round here, I think is the only way. And what I also think is the only way, if I think 12 minutes, is that everyone who wants to say something, think about it, says it now. <laughs> <laughs> and then we take all the people who want to say something, and then we come back, so that we have a clear rule, and somehow afterwards we will drink, we will have beer, we will discuss, and we will go on yeah. in other settings. But for now, who, I have two people who want to say something, who else, three, Four. So then I think this is very good. We can totally do that. So we will start with you. Um, is it this one? What is it? I think this one is the easier uh, one to. Where is it? No, it's it. <laughs> Where is the? Where is the mic? Oh, it's there. Be there. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I lost it. I'm sorry. Here again. Um, yeah, I feel a bit bad again taking the mic, um, but okay, you had the chance to say something, so I'm okay. So um, something happened again that always happens when I uh, put this uh, on the on the topic list is that people get defensive. Like, but we think like maybe it comes across to me because I'm also very sensitive about this or sensible or I don't know. Um, so um, it is for me. I wanted to address that. Uh, it's not about, uh, it's not a critique towards uh, um, Savi, it's just uh, something that uh, that I ask myself, um, ca is this, uh, can this go parallelly, like a very complex um, 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 a, a trajectory of uh, theory and, uh, and, um, and uh, practical um, culture of, um, of togetherness? Um, 
uh, is it a contradiction or are there more ways to really connect this? Because for me, there's like there's like a, a massive gap between the theory and the praxis, and that is something that is because uh, if, for example, if you say you you need to take time to read the uh, the text, the thing is you you just you don't only need time, but you actually need to have a specific education to understand it because these words are not yeah, things that. Layers, yeah, but uh, yeah, but yeah, we okay. Take it So, um, I've got a question uh, to the both uh, institutions. Um, what is the exactly the, um, what do you think is the audience of a para-institution? Um, and where is the line between your community and the audience? Where, where do you see, um, who, who is the audience and who is, who is your community? Thanks. I'm uh, interested how you want to to consider a possibility between your new institute and what you. I mean, what is what is your impact in this idea? And number four was. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I'm Hannah. I study product design uh, also at this university. And I, um, I just wanted to ask you if you think it's um, how you consider the weight of your theoretical knowledge and reason uh, behind getting funds or being taken seriously as a community or a power institution. Um, if you think that it's really necessary that all the participants have uh, common ground to, to think and talk and if this is a important measure to build the community or if this is only one uh, specified layer in this power institution so I will I guess um, to be also democratic to myself I guess I will answer not the first one and not the last one somewhere in the middle and I will is there one of you who wants to answer so of course, again, um, about uh, complexity and uh, uh, practice, I think I already answered before, but I again think that um, uh, our concept can be really read from different perspectives. You can, you can find complex word and a complex vocabulary, but there are also there is also another level, that, that, and, uh, other entry points, uh, other entry um, uh, key words that are opening up possibilities for reflection. And also, it's not that we are giving uh, for granted that people are have to receive uh, this concept from above. We are given this concept and uh, you have to uh, digest it. But the opposite, we just write in to then sit together and discuss and deconstruct even what we, we are writing together. So it's not, um, uh, it's not a pre-packed uh, uh, set of uh, words and a vocabulary that we want to, um, uh, to give for granted. So, um, and also to reflect uh, the complexity of, uh, um, of the reality of, uh, of the situation in which we are. I think uh, it's inevitable to <laughs> to come to end uh, with uh, complex uh, words sometimes. So um, about uh, the audience and uh, uh, the community, um, I think uh, for us uh, since the beginning um, it was very important to to create uh, a community, so a, a group of people that are. Um, uh, constantly and uh, present and they are always talking to us and we're talking to them so creating uh, this group of reciprocal and mutual uh, nurturing of each other uh, uh, but talking about the audience I think we um, don't want to be self-referential or to just reach uh, people from the art world, especially because in Berlin, the art institutions, uh, um, uh, at least when we founded Savi, we 
we understood that there was not so much possibility of inclusivity. Unfortunately, the discourse was or so complex or so uh, disentangled by uh, the um, by reflection on intersectionality and uh, how the society is um, um, complex. So we try to avoid uh, the tautology. We are not talking only about art, to artists, to professionals, but we are uh, um, performing also music, literature. We are understanding culture as a very open uh, realm and uh, we are keeping what when we say we're keeping our doors open and you're saying that that's a sort of a neoliberal uh, attitude i actually want to say that you also have to understand uh, the struggle uh, of people that first of all uh, yes don't have the time to engage in uh, um, uh, cultural activities but also that too often are not feeling welcome in in certain spaces so this idea of uh, uh, being there to embrace a larger uh, community, a larger audience, I think it's something quite uh, oppositely, uh, um, uh, quite opposite to the what what happens in the neoliberal um, economies. So I don't know if you also want to say just something a bit, about. Just a bit about the kind of audience I mean, for us, the, like the audience is, is quite important because. Of, of the act of the Museum of Impossible Forms, locating itself in a predominantly working class neighborhood on the first floor of a mall, yeah. it's very difficult to get there. Most people get lost, um, partly because they don't read maps properly, actually. Yeah. But, but so, but, but so it, it's about kind of uh, locating ourselves there. And you know, the, the way we think of our work, we think of it in terms of, uh, as much as we despise the binary, we think of it within the binary, ironically, of, of the light and the shadow. So a lot of, yeah. we do a lot of things that is in the light that is there to kind of, that is a bit of a spectacle that makes the, the, the funders' um, logos look good and, you know, and they feel that they've given the money. But then there's work yeah. that we do that is not for public. So for example, our writing school, um, um, that is conducted by author Hassan Blasim um, with in, in Arabic. You know, it's, it's it's very kind of specific. It's for it's for people who who, who speak Arabic, um, and it's not a public thing. Okay, some of the works that they do it does get publicized um, or published. Sorry, but it's not. I mean, f f that's a slow work. It's work that you can't post online and create hype because it's it's, it's, it's not going to work. You know, so it's, it's work that just goes on, that fails, you pick up, you start again, you do it. Um, then it's also about, for us, an important part of, of our strategy, and I spoke about this in my musing on, on cinema, is that how does one, how does, how does the object of what we do, especially within the, con now, I'm, I'm a cinematographer, so I'm also not like a theoretical type, um, or the whatever. Um, um, so, but f for us, it's like, how do we use the process of cinema as a process not to make a film, but to build community. And this we've learned from a collective in Cape Town that called Kino Cadre, and they actively go against the art world. They don't even, yeah. they, they, they don't, they're totally not part of the art world. The art world, a lot of people in the art world, I tell them about, they're like, who are they? Who are these guys? But, and these guys at, at Kino Cadre, they, it's a, pr a project that's been running for almost more than a decade, and sorry, and they. Uh, so what we've learned from them, it's about this kind of thing of using your medium as a metaphor, as, uh, of using what you do as a way to do something else. So okay. in the case of Kinokade, to build community, actually. And I mean, as we know, the time is over, but uh, that was a clear question to me, and I think I have to take the time to answer it. I try to answer it as good as I can. Um, when I came here, I actually gave a lecture on the Para Museum, and I tried to understand Documenta as much as a German institution as 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 an Para institution. So, how to say it? Just very quickly, I, I put your I can understand your question in many ways. One of them is a very critical way that I like very much, and I rephrase it now in how I understand it. And this question is, how do you want to, um, how do you want to evolve 
this idea of the para institution if you are in the very moment embedded in a process that is obviously about the brand documenta when you are um, about to establish and build a new institution that is important for Germany, Hessen and Kassel and that will go out playing documenta everywhere. And um, I will come back to another way how I can understand your question as well, but I want to answer that one first. And to this question, my answer is that actually I think the documenta in itself was from the very beginning as much embedded in a problematic ideology um, of the, in the West so-called Cold War, as it was a place in which these binaries of the world were deeply challenged. So I want to relate to this. I want to relate to the possibility to be completely part of an ideological framework and despite of it, create spaces of freedom in which it is possible to think beside and beyond this, and in our case now, neoliberal framework that will make this institution grow. Um, in order to do that, I think, and this is what I would, um, I mean, this is what I think now for how I want to go, and it relates a bit to the question of the shadow and the light, um, that actually um, also could be an interesting reference to Brecht. Um, I think that the para-institutional strategy is on the one hand, to play the game. To play the game as, but all, I, I say not cynical, as honest and clearly go inside the institution and bring further, working within and making the institution happen, what is to be brought further. Second is to, second is protest. The second is to just not accept everything in every situation. And then to see that this binary of two positions is not how we are governed in the neoliberal world we live in. So I would propose as a third one to create these little pockets of shadow in which some alternative ways of thinking and knowing can also happen. So how are these pockets possible? I think pockets cannot exist just by themselves. So theoretically, I would say that um, we can learn from Foucault that actually when one one way to govern um, is when it is kind of uh, added to another way to govern, so let's say the prison and the um, control, the first one doesn't stop. So in the moment of the surveillance camera, we still are in a world of prisons. Mm -hmm. And more and more where people who have nothing, done nothing than just leave a place, for example, are. So if we imagine that it, with Foucault, that each of these ways to govern creates their own resistance. I don't wonder that we need also contradictory, to think contradictory resistances or contradictory way to answer or to be para-institutional in these frameworks. So where I see the pocket of freedom is the possibility to play this also in a certain sense out against each other. And one possibility is the freedom, the freedom of teaching and the freedom of um, of art and the free and the, in this sense also autonomy we come back to it and the freedom of research of course i don't believe that it totally exists but i think i can claim it in order to create these pockets and i could give like many other of those examples so i mean i am as i try neither cynical nor naive to give my best we will see most probably i will um not win but maybe we can do it together I think we go have a beer and find each other, talk and see what can happen. <laughs> yeah? Thank you very much. And ah, actually, I've, I, now with the question, please forgive me that I just for a second um, lost my role of the moderator. Okay. Just have, I have to step into it again and just say, hey, friends, it was very generous. I mean, honestly, I came up with this question and it is very, very generous of you that you that you answered, that you brought like little parts inside, that you questioned it, that you brought something further. I am amazed by what you gave us, by what you gave us with your lecture performance. And thank you to all of you to stay with us and still believe in your desires when the words were so complicated. And, but now it's over, thanks. <laughs>